Um, so hopefully people had time to sort of think about what they heard this morning and reflect on that. Um, and what we're going to do now is to have a panel of people who really are from different um, parts of the service system and sort of um, have different responsibilities um, to really um, offer their thoughts on what we um, um, heard this morning or what, what people have learned. And the way we're going to do this is I'm just going to pose some questions and just um, get people to offer their thoughts. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna end at about, with the conversation with the panel, at about quarter after, 20 after, and then we're gonna ask people who've been here to offer your thoughts, both on what struck you and what you would like to see going forward. So that again, we don't see this as a one-time event, but as the beginning of a conversation and the beginning of trying to think differently. So what I'd like to do first is just to very quickly introduce our panel. So um, at the very end, we have Sue Abderholden, who's the executive director of NAMI in Minnesota. Um, we have beside her, State Senator Terry Bonoff um, from District 44, um, and who is on the, she is the Higher Education and Workforce Development Committee Chair. And then we have Billy Collins, um, who is the Chief Executive Officer for, in the YWCA in St. Paul. We have Mary Farrell, who's the co-founder and executive vice president um, and senior consultant for Math Associates. Um, and then we have Julie Kleinsmith, um, who's the Ramsey County manager. And Mark Tugood, who is the direct director of the Transition to Economic Stability Division in the Minnesota Department of Human Services. So we've got some great um, minds, talent, um, and we're again going to hear their reflections. So today, just sort of to get us started, so what we heard today were presentations that really suggest that if we're going to significantly improve children's outcomes, we need to focus more on thinking about what we can do for adults, either adults who are their parents or adults who care for them, and really thinking about what we can use for brain science um, and what we can learn from that. So I just want to ask you, what's your reaction to that message? And what do you think the implications are for the investments that you make in families? And I will let whoever wants to start. We don't, everybody doesn't have to answer any, every question. So um, Mark, I'm gonna put you on the spot though to start this one. Um, so why don't you get us started and then anybody else that wants to add their thoughts can do that. Thank you so much for putting me on the spot. <laughs> so is, is, this thing, is this thing on actually? Can you hear, can you hear me okay? So, you know, first thing, it strikes me as a little bit of a Western construct that the parent-child relationship is somehow antagonistic, uh, just as a premise. So if the question is, if we're going to significantly improve children's outcomes, we will need to do more to build capabilities of their parents and other adults to care for them. That seems to me to be sort of a, um, obvious. Of course we do unless we're prepared to remove children from parents who are merely poor, merely struggling, have mental health challenges, chemical depend dependency issues. Um, so it, it just, that question is rubbing me the wrong way, I guess. I think, I think the implications, though, are the, um, the kinds of investments for our families that we're talking about today need to be significant. They need to be at the level of the need. They need to be comprehensive in nature and um, long-term in their outlook and orientation. And so in terms of quick fixes, silver bullets, and, you know, and, a, and a rapid return on investment, uh, I don't think that's um, at the level of magnitude needed to address the needs of these families. I was struck by what, what was going on at uh, Crittenden Women's Union with the levels and the long-term commitment, five years or more setting long-term goals, I think that's the right orientation. It's, it's in terms of human capital investment, it's, I think we're looking at long-term investments that really make a difference and will stick. Okay, who else on the panel wants to, go ahead, Billy. Okay, and I agree uh, with the comment about really looking at the family. Uh, this is really about the family and getting the family engaged and then also, um, there was some um, very good presentations today, some very good services, some very good programs, some very good things are going on. And actually, I'm proud to be part of the Twin Cities area in the state of Minnesota where we do some very good things. But I think also what we need to do is we need to be honest about kind of some of the issues that are out there that are preventing people from being successful. 
And I think we really need to be focusing on removing barriers that prevent people from being successful. Hello? Can you hear me now? Is it on? Okay, sorry about that. I think we need to talk about removing barriers uh, for people uh, that prevent them from being successful. And as we talk about things and we talk about uh, brain science, and I'll talk about an experience I had with that a couple of weeks ago, uh, a little bit later, but um, we really need to be honest about talking about this is about race, it's about ethnicity, it's about culture, it's about religion, it's about lifestyles, it's about home environments, et cetera. We need to take all those things into consideration as we're talking about brain science and how we're working with folks and helping to remove those barriers that have prevented them from being successful in the past. I'll grab it. Again, thank you very much for having me today. I'm State Senator Terry Bonoff. I represent Minnetonka and Plymouth in the legislature. I think it's very complicated, and I agree with uh, the comments that have gone before me about um, who is, uh, who we're talking about here. And I think we have to look at the cycle and the cycle of <coughs> violence, so to speak. You know, if you look at the the brain development information, and I know you talked about that this morning, and I've had uh, the occasion to listen to Dr. Anda a couple times. How many of you have heard Dr. Anda's research? So some of you, um, his research focused on what happens when a parent and child do have a disconnect and how that disconnect manifests itself throughout their lifetime and then how they repeat that with their children and their children's children. And we all know that and we've all seen that. And so somehow we have to do something that intervenes in that cycle. And I think you have to look at it from, you know, who's in prison, from who is getting government services, and really consider that should we be giving anyone access to government services without an intervention plan? I mean, aren't we really in many ways just throwing away our resources if we're just saying we'll give you support, but we aren't there to be side by side with a plan of intervention? And you can talk about, and I, I see some familiar faces around here, so I know I'm preaching to the choir, but you can talk about the importance of investing, and I would say investing without intervention is uh, no better than not investing at all. And so um, people think it's expensive. Uh, people talk about, you know, government as big brother. What's our role with the family? But I would push back and say that we are being poor stewards of our dollar if every time we interact with any person on social services, we're not in their home finding out what supports they need with regard to raising their children, with regard to employment, with regard to keeping their employment, with regard to mental health. And those are the kind, I think that's the approach we ought to have. And then I think you'd find that we would spend less money over time versus more money. It doesn't work. <laughs> All right, I'll try. Oh, okay. Well, one thing I just wanted to add is that um, it's really only a recent phenomena that we've actually recognized that parents have a mental illness and have their children with them. Um, a decade ago, I can tell you, when I came to NAMI, no one was talking about parents with mental illnesses. And in fact, when people would leave ANOCA um, Regional Treatment Center, there wasn't even anything in the discharge plan that said, how would we reconnect this parent to their child? So that just wasn't out there. So this is actually fairly new. And um, I don't think we've done anything close to what we need to do in terms of integrating both um, children and adults' mental health issues together. Um, we finally just, you know, it's a recent um, development in terms of having a, a, uh, an intensive outpatient program for moms where they can bring their babies. Um, if you're on MFIP and you have SSI and you need childcare to go to a DBT group every week, guess what? You don't get it. So to say that we're integrated, we are not even close to it, and we're just really beginning to talk about it. Um, I think the two presentations today did, did show two different models where they did integrate services and, and really reduce some of the silos. And, and just as part of the research team, we spent a lot of time reviewing cases and 
and understanding some of the family situations. And it's true that they, you know, they're dealing with homelessness and mental health issues and child behavioral issues. And, and I think it, you know, um, it, it was really important to interact, to deal holistically with the family. And I think FAST did a really um, good job of, of integrating them. Well, I know you didn't say we, or you said we didn't all have to weigh in, but of course I have to weigh in. <laughs> Um, first of all, I just, uh, I, I just want to thank all of the practitioners for being in this room. Uh, a lot of you are on the front lines and you're doing this work every day. And uh, I, I sit up with the policymakers and uh, we make some tough uh, funding decisions. It's really, really been informative for me to be here and hear um, not only these presentations, but hear you as practitioners talking. And um, of course, I'm very proud of Ramsey County, and we welcome you all here, even if you live in another county. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I, and I'm gonna, I, I just want to take a second to talk about um, what we call a bag goal. You've all heard of it. Big, hairy, audacious goal in Ramsey County, because what's interesting is we have really been talking about economic prosperity for all. And um, really tackling, um, I, I want to riff a little bit on what Billy said about um, the stark disparities in our community and the concentration of poverty. Um, Ramsey County has, um, you heard Jim McDonough this morning, um, I want to repeat it for you, 25% of our children live in poverty in Ramsey County. And, um, uh, and we, by the year 2030, probably closer to 2020, uh, we will be over 50% uh, people of color in Ramsey County. And it's the children of color um, who are not achieving in our schools. And this is an institutional problem. Um, again, Billy talks about removing barriers. We're really rethinking, what, what does that mean, removing barriers? Um, uh, it, it means that um, we don't just clear something out of the path so you can still get to us. No, we have to get to you. And so this is, this is pretty exciting, looking at this holistically. Um, again, back to this economic prosperity, this is where we tie workforce, um, jobs. Uh, we, we're calling it a web of opportunity in our neighborhoods. Um, and the linchpin for us is education, jobs. Um, there are three measures of capital, or three measures of wealth. Uh, one is capital, one's land, but we know the most important one is people, and that's what we're talking about here today. So um, personally, I'm just thrilled to death that um, your mind can, you 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 actually can adapt even as an adult. So <laughs> I'm going to breathe deeply now and turn it back over to you. Okay. Still can't? Okay, now, okay. Okay, about a week, a little over a week ago, I participated in this whole thing about brain science. It's really new to me. But uh, I'm on the Juvenile Justice Advisory Committee for the state of Minnesota. We put on a forum for, that spoke to juvenile offenders uh, with a uh, sentence to life without parole. So it was this big issue about the brain and the brain not developing, and, and it was a very interesting dialogue. Uh, I've got no view one way or the other, so I'm not pushing anything right now. But some of the things that came out of that were that if you've got a 14 or a 15-year-old that is sentenced to life without parole, then that person goes into an institution and is confined, and there's no incentive for this person to learn, to get a high school diploma, to improve their life skills, whatever the case may be. And I'm just saying this because these were the facts that were presented. Again, this is not my feelings one way or the other. But what happens is this person is in a rut. So and we heard today talking about brain science and talking about stimulation and so on and so forth. So you've got a young person that's incarcerated 
and there's no, uh, no effort or no momentum for them to move forward with their lives or learn anything. And I compare that to a family that's on MFIP, that's uh, in a household that's un unemployed, that's got high crime area, what have you, and they're in a rut. And if barriers aren't removed and if they're not motivated to do things differently and move on with their life, their minds are not going to be stimulated to do some other positive things. So again, as we talk about things today and we talk about brain science, however we look at this, whether it's from a scientific field of brain science, whether it's from other data collection, whether it's in the streets doing the core work or what have you, we need to look at that family unit and stimulating that family unit so that there's some hope that they want to move forward in their lives. And I'm going to follow up with the next question, which is, where are the opportunities to actually do that, to do things differently, to build on sort of the knowledge that we heard this morning, to be a leader in really thinking about how do we really engage um, people, parents, agencies, in really thinking about um, working with parents as a way to really improve outcomes for kids. So where do we start? Okay. Thank you. I'll take that one. Oh. Let's, let's leave that microphone on. They'll think, oh, now it's working. Okay. I just want to tell a story about a program that's working. And this isn't the only program that's working, but it illustrates um, something that's out there. And that is the Parent-Child Home Program. The Parent-Child Home Program right now is operating in the western suburbs. Jewish Family Children's Service is serving low-income families in their area. Oh, people are participating. Oh, I see people from the Jewish Family Children's Service are back there. But um, what this program does is it's voluntary. It goes, it's, um, goes into low-income families where the children are between eight and months and four years of age. The family makes a two-year commitment. The person who is serving that family has to go in two days a week. It's a franchise program. So the parent company is in New York. It's been around for over 40 years. The person goes in and the first day of the week they bring a book or a toy and they role model to the parent how to read to a child or how to play to that child. The second time they go during that week, the, um, they watch the parent do what they role modeled the day before. They do that between September and June, twice a week. They never miss. They do that for two years. And at the end of that, they, the family graduates. And there's a rule that says once you've done it for one child, you don't get to go back again. You get one shot at it. And the results, and they've reported their results, the results are phenomenal, that it actually changes the parents' lives, that the parents' ability to get better jobs as a result of that, to upgrade their own education, changes dramatically. And looking at the longitudinal data over the 40 years, you can see that this you know, pretty small investment, actually, the child's results go all the way through high school. They're graduating at the same rate as their middle class peers, and the standard of living goes up. And so what I take from that is that you know every parent wants to do what's best for their child, and they want to be the best parent they can be. And so if we give them the tools, then we will see that kind of success. Heather, um, I'll just talk from kind of the national research from what we've found. Um, we have found that um, to really improve child outcomes, you have to increase family income. And a lot of these studies we've done on welfare to work, they found that basically we're successful at getting people off of welfare, but just exchanging an employment check for a welfare check and their family income hasn't increased. But the one study that gets cited all over the place was um, a study of MFEP that, that Donna talked about um, in, in the 1990s. And it's an earlier version of MFIP. It's when you had an enhanced earned income disregard. And um, a lot of people did stay on welfare, but, but they were working and, and, and getting welfare and their overall family income increased. And there was a child outcome study that was done and it improved child outcomes. And, it, and it's been really rare to find those um, kind of evaluations that have improved child outcomes. So we're always citing it. And then Milwaukee, I think, um, did something similar and found the same results. So I think if you want to improve child outcomes, you, one way is to improve you know, family income. Okay. Okay. 
And so now I'm a great follow-up to that because I'm probably the biggest cheerleader for IPS um, employment that there is in the state of Minnesota. I mean, it works. We have a lot of employment programs out there that frankly don't produce the same results. And I think because it's more of an integrated model, um, that's what really makes it successful. And I think the thing to think about is that, yes, in the past we all said, well, you know, that the stress of working for someone with a mental illness is really tough. But I challenge you to think about the stress of staying home alone, isolated, and having only daytime TV to watch. That is far more stressful, um, frankly, than going to job. Now, it might be that the family can't work full time. I think that that sometimes is difficult. There's sometimes, if you have a mental illness, a little flexibility in there is helpful on those days when the symptoms are really coming back. Um, but I think it breaks that isolation, which then often you know, increases the depression symptoms, which makes it more difficult to connect with your child. It just kind of goes on and on. So um, IPS for more populations than just people with a serious mental illness makes a lot of sense to me. Are there ideas of where there are opportunities? I just um, put in a couple of plugs here. One is that I think the, the whole notion of career pathways for me is striking for our popular, for MPIP folks uh, with bridges, you know, starting where they are and the bridges and support services to keep moving. You know, they'll, they'll earn and learn, do both of those things. But the prospect that they've got a, a longer term goal and they're able to get supports to keep moving across the bridge in the earlier presenter's metaphor. And in that vein, you know, the executive functioning piece, it's, it struck me, uh, is, is intuitive, it makes sense, and having uh, our participants engaged in meaningless activities um, that don't actually comport with their goals and their plans, to document and verify um, inherently meaningless activity, you know, have your instructor sign this and you know, prove that you, you made X number of calls and so forth, is anathema to actually an agency taking control of their lives and doing something meaningful. And in that vein, um, Deb Schlick asked me to, to not forget the broader policy context that we're, we're all st sort of stuck with, uh, with the work participation rate, and that we, have, we are engaged in a lot of distraction and uh, inherently meaningless activity with a lot of that work, and that we are pursuing as the state of Minnesota a TANF waiver possibility to actually have meaningful outcomes that are client-oriented, family-centered, and will hopefully be uh, better for employment outcomes and, and wages ultimately as well. That's great. Billy, go ahead. One other thing is we talk about you know, what we can do, and we really need to start talking about short-term and long-term goals. Uh, and I'll give you an example. Um, there's a group of providers, uh, em employment providers, uh, Goodwill, Easter Seals, YWCA, Ramsey County Workforce Solutions, and we've got businesses in the southern and the northern suburbs that have good entry-level positions for folks who have high school diploma, GED, haven't had post-secondary education, entry-level positions, not meaning dead-end jobs, not meaning minimum wage jobs, just entry-level at based upon their skill set. But we've had success in getting people promoted, going in at $11 an hour, up to $15 an hour now, in a matter of seven months. Uh, the employers really like the, the employees, but the reality of it is they're in the suburbs. And the transportation is a barrier to the folks getting there. So we've been very successful with those folks that we've been able to get there. So what's happened now is we have an employer that tomorrow morning, I think, the head staff is having a meeting with the staff from the different agencies. I'm going to sit down with this employer. This employer is prepared to put some money on the table to help leverage some additional dollars to provide some temporary transportation service. Met Council is aware of this. Metropolitan Transit is aware of this. And they are looking at changing the transportation plan because for this one company, the last the bus gets and it gets you within two miles of their place of business. Um, then another business out there, there's a bus that gets you closer than that, but it only runs between eight and five. And these are call centers, and they have three different shifts. So if you can get there at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you can't get home at night. So there's these things that are going on. So what's being attempted now is some short-term goals to get some transportation to get the folks there 
while the Met Council and Met Transportation, Met Transit, is working on their plan, which we've been told is anywhere from 18 months to 24 months to get it you know, laid out, implemented, funded, whatever the case may be. But meanwhile, we've got folks, we've got employers that need employees, and we've got people who want to go to work, but we just can't get them there. So short-term goals, long-term goals, working together at the same time. Okay, and you'll, you'll think that Billy and I practiced beforehand, but um, you know, what Jim McDonough was talking about first thing this morning was about those bigger transportation investments and understanding when we make those 100-year investments what we're actually doing if we are investing in um, uh, areas that are already served and ignoring underserved areas. Um, this particular example, um, we would like next time to get ahead of that and be in front of it in terms of working closely. So what can we do as policymakers? We can, we can have forge a better, tighter relationship with business. So when business made the decision to build that call center out in the suburbs with no transportation um, along a corridor I drive every day, um, uh, you know, that was short-sighted. Um, we were short-sighted in not um, helping to figure out where there was property in the city by these folks um, that can um, um, uh, take these jobs. So those are those big picture things that we're really focusing on, I think, so that we can create the climate so that your, these programs can succeed because then people can get to the jobs, get to good jobs. So to, go ahead. It's hard not to jump in on that one because I feel so strongly about it as well. You know, I uh, have the Southwest Light Rail coming right through just uh, next to my district. United Health Group did expand there. Um, there's a call center that Comcast has, and the proposed Southwest Light Rail is supposed to go right through there. And right now is really stopped because of this dispute that's going on between Minneapolis and St. Louis Park. If we don't get that dispute resolved in very short order, we're actually gonna lose this whole line. And there are people around, you know, in my circles who think, good, then I'll get that money. It'll go to my, that won't be the case. That money will go to a different state. And so we have to be better as policymakers, you know, making nice in the sandbox. You can't just have a fight and think it's okay to fight and fight and fight. We have to resolve these things. And just today, I was on a conference call with this national organization called No Labels. And their uh, charter is to find a way to rise above partisan politics and actually get things done. And they said, that, you know, we think we should cure cancer. And I said, well, that's noble that that's what we should be working on. But let me give you something, you know, a, <laughs> a little easier. And she said, what? And I said, how about having transportation infrastructure be a national conversation so that we understand we're not competitive to the rest of the world and that we, mm -hmm. on a bipartisan basis tackle transportation. So on this very day, I was uh, working on the same issue. And, and that is a, a level the playing field kind of thing. It's because when people have opportunities to get places, just, and I will stop after this one, but just driving here, I got a call from a constituent who got a letter from me congratulating her on her high school graduation. So I called her, said, what can I do for you? And she said, well, I need to get a job. And I said, well, do you live you know, in Plymouth? Because I know there's interfaith outreach. They could help you. And she said, no, I live in North Minneapolis. She was part of the Choices Yours program. Well, now she's graduated. She doesn't have the support system. She went through the Wyzetta schools and now finds herself stranded in North Minneapolis. So these are economic issues, and they're important. OK, I'm going to just sort of divert a little bit, because I think that rather than sort of going on to the next question, what I'd like to do is just to give people an opportunity who've been, who are listening to see if you have anything to add of where do you see, given where you sit, where do you see the opportunities? Because I think it would be good for everyone to hear some of your ideas on, again, where do you see there are opportunities to do things differently, to do new things that would really sort of build on what we heard about this morning? Does anybody have anything they want to, um, any ideas they want to throw out? <laughs> Silence. Just one thing. Oh, go ahead.
Well, and I, I, I can't answer the question, but I wonder too, given what Phil said this morning about the toolbox that NIH created, whether there's an opportunity to use those measures in workforce programs, in parenting programs, to really get a sense of what does it look like, where are the deficits, and where, where are the things that actually build executive function. So, I mean, I think we can sort of look some more to see what that is, but he said it's easy to administer, cheap to administer, so it seems to have the right set of characteristics, and it is something you could potentially adopt in lots of programs, both for kids and for adults. Um, so that sort of seems to me like that might be worth pursuing. Go ahead. Another opportunity for them in the fall, I think, in the next life cycle, but just a And I would just like to sort of push when Mark said that sort of this idea that we don't think about parents and kids together. I actually think what's interesting for me being a researcher, if you look at the home visiting literature, what you see is a lot of sort of effort on measuring and improving outcomes for kids. You see very little measurement of outcomes for adults. And when we do measure it, you don't see the same kind of impacts that you would hope you would see. It varies by program. But it seems that there is room in both sort of workforce programs and in programs that are focused more on kids to think about, are we really reaching both the kids and the adults? And I think home visiting is sort of a, 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 an ideal platform since it is in people's homes and it's focusing. But again, my sort of experience of looking at the home visiting programs and literature is that we don't know enough about how much they actually impact what's happening for adults. We know a lot about their impact on kids. And so that seems like that could also be a place where there's room for synergy and thinking more about how do we do both of those things simultaneously. If I could just add, I mean, we do do preschool screening, but it's only recently that we've looked at doing screening of moms when they're visiting pediatricians to see what their mental health is doing and how they are doing. So it, it needs to be a, a broader spectrum. Somebody could. Go ahead. I, I, I just think that's a really great question, and um, <laughs> which means I don't have the answer because that's how you that's how you always address it. You know what a good question. Um, <laughs> but I will tell you that there is a pretty important table that's working on that question, and um, uh, it's called Generation Next. And um, it, it, you've probably just read about it recently when um, uh, Mayor Ryback, RT. Um, my close personal friend, R.T., um, <laughs> became the executive director. But the concept there is getting uh, business, the institutional partners who would be, you know, uh, many of us in St. Paul School Districts, the, you know, the two, you know, Ramsey and Hennepin Counties, the two big elephants in the room, um, uh, and the, the foundations together, all trying to align um, to best practices and so that as we're making those investments, we are all aligned in making those investments. Um, it's been an interesting conversation because as you can imagine, um, what, what's so fascinating about this is I would like this whole presentation to go to that table because uh, a few of us have been pushing the issue um, that uh, you can't just measure third grade reading, it's too late. Um, that this is all 
you know, um, f you know, this is this is very early childhood, and that we need to be talking about public health, and um, we need to be talking about the whole family, not the child as this separate unit. When kids are in school, nine percent of the time. Um, so I have a lot of hope uh, about this group. And um, now I've even said it in front of you guys that I would like to bring this to that table um, because I, I think it would really inform their thinking. So long answer that says people are working on it. <laughs> Anybody else want to respond on how do we sort of make changes in mediocre programs so that people have more opportunities <laughs> to have Get built a lot skills of and people talking about it? I don't know that I can respond to that one, but. But I, I do think that there's a lot of programs out there, you know, in, in, in Minnesota that are really focusing on maybe improving executive <coughs> functioning. And, and I'm thinking of, you know, your ARMS program, which is a home visiting program that focuses on <coughs> individuals with mental health services and you're focused on um, meeting goals and how do you get to those goals. And there are a lot of training and coaching that's involved. Um, is that enough? And can we measure whether it's improving executive functioning? Um, a lot of TANF programs operate life skills training. Is that good enough? I mean, is, are there thing, improvements that we can make to that? Um, there's cognitive behavioral therapy that a lot of, a lot of programs are using or dialectical <coughs> behavioral therapy. And I don't think we know enough about what components are necessary and, and whether they are actually improving you know, executive functioning. There's still a lot more to learn, but I think there's a lot of stuff going out there. There's a lot of stuff within each of the various programs. Go ahead. I, I'm Glenna Sedwell, I'm a director of children's mental health at DHS. And we have been working for a number of years in close cooperation with the Institute of Child Development at the University of Minnesota. And actually, I just made Boyd Brown an honorary mental health professional today <laughs> for, for his insight about the fundamental structure of cognitive behavioral therapy as actually uh, being a way to build all of these building blocks of executive function. And we have been working closely with Bruce Tropita at UCLA to actually bring this training to all of our children's mental health professionals so that when they do skills training with children, this is exactly what they're working on. And so, you know, my goal before I retire is that anywhere you went and got a publicly funded ch children's mental health service, it should be informed by exactly this work and we should be able to measure that we're getting these outcomes. That's, that's what we're aiming for. And I think we probably need to be thinking about the same thing for adults. Um, if we had more time, the other program I would have brought to um, present is a program in New Haven called the Moms Partnership. And it literally is a partnership of agencies. And what they decided to do was to do a, they call it stress reduction, um, but it is a cognitive behavioral therapy um, inter intervention for families. They're trying to reach families who are not connected to any services. Um, and they have had amazing results at keeping people engaged in that program. And I always refer to them as the one of the most out-of-the-box thinking groups I have ever seen. They created an app that they call the Mamba app. And what they do is they send out an email, they send out a, an app with a challenge to try and keep people who are generally not engaged engaged. They are actually working with the grocery store to create a mental health center and a workforce center in the grocery store. So they are reducing the, um, the burden of getting people to services. They're going to start doing workforce in people's homes so that they really are trying to think about taking this science and saying, how do we reduce the burden on families and how do we really try and build executive function that will lead to workforce outcomes, not only, and better outcomes for their kids. So I think there are a few examples out there but that's one that we didn't have time to be able to present, but I think it's another model of really that I think would work well in some parts of um, the, your service system. So other sort of, go ahead, Billy. One other thing I just want to say, I don't believe that there's mediocre programs out there. We may have small struggling programs and what have you, but you know what? We have great need out there, and everyone that's got their doors open and is doing something is doing something that's needed in their community, regardless of what the numbers are or whatever the case may be. But I hear what you're saying, and one of the things is that, you know, when we start talking about families and stabilizing families and removing barriers and what have you, you know, families have housing issues, employment issues, health care issues, education issues, uh, safety issues, on and on and on and on and on. And there are so many different collaboratives, initiatives, efforts, and what have you, that folks can't stay up on what's going on. 
And you know, we're a medium-sized nonprofit organization, and my staff is stretched. We're stressed between doing services, direct services, and also trying to stay on top of all the things that are going on. But what we really need to do, and I, I talked about the transportation piece, not to talk about any great services or whatnot, but to talk about this is a community need, is transportation. It just happens that there's two or three agencies that are taking the lead on this, but we're trying to get transportation for everybody in St. Paul proper, Minneapolis proper, what have you, out to the southern and the northern uh, suburbs in those positions. So this isn't about any one organization. It's about making some change. And we've got Metro Council at the table, and they're listening, and they understand they've got to do something about their transportation flow. So those are long-range and short-range goals. The, so what we really are looking at is kind of like repositories. Where can we go? And then ultimately, there needs to be a larger repository to really start talking about impacting policy, whether that's policies at the federal level, state level, uh, uh, county level, whatever. We need to start talking about strategies around impacting policy that remove barriers or create more paperwork that prevents staff or take, choose up staff time doing documentation and paperwork versus getting the services out there. And we know there's some things that are coming up. I know people in this room have to be aware of what's happening with GED after the first of the year. So we're getting folks who are on TANF and what have you, and we're really getting them geared up, and we're getting folks psyched up about getting into entry-level positions, getting their GED to do that, what have you. And all of a sudden, the rug is pulled out from underneath them, and it's going to be very challenging after January 1st for them to get their GED. One of the things, the strategies that came up behind that, I know that there's some folks working on it on a long-term basis to try to undo that. But meanwhile, Ramsey County took it upon themselves, and they did some very creative things working with some of their infant providers to between now and, what is it, the 15th of December they've got to get their GED uh, under the current process to get work with folks to get that done. And so that's a short-term strategy, but while that's going on, there's still this long-term strategy about addressing that and maybe reversing how that GED thing is going to happen after the first of the year. And I want to go back. Is it Dana? Yes. What I heard Dana asking is how about those people who fall through the cracks mm -hmm. and that, um, that we don't get to every person. And so then I would go back to um, there is a, a point of touch that happens at the state. And that point of touch happens uh, in the Department of Ed when there's a free and reduced lunch family or um, Minsure when they're looking for health care, or the Department of Health who's uh, providing some other service. And I think it's really important for us as uh, state policymakers to eliminate those silos, and we're working on it. We consolidated all of our IT functions so that we do have the ability to cross departments. But it would be, I think, a uh, a long-range goal to say that anytime there's a touch with a person with regard to services, that any um, support, financial support they get, has to be linked to quality services. And that, you know, for example, the um, early childhood scholarships, we partnered with the Parent Aware um, program, whereby you only can use the low-income, you know, scholarship if you put your child in high-quality education. And I think that has to be the way that we think, that you know, nobody should just get the service without making sure that they're connected to something that provides quality outcomes. Great. So uh, that's sort of a good segue into the next, my next question, which is what do you see if you're really going to rethink how you do services and to focus much more on trying to get better outcomes for adults? Um, what are the hurdles? What are the hurdles to change? What are the hurdles to changing programs that exist and making them more effective? What are the hurdles to doing new programs that really try and sort of be creative and think out of the box? Um, what are the hurdles to reaching more families? And what, so what do you think the main hurdles are that you really have to overcome if you're really going to take seriously doing things differently? Mark, you going to start? Thanks. I, I was actually going to respond to Dana's uh, point also, but I think I no, can, that's okay. you can do both. collapse the two here. 
And I, you know, w without taking away anything from anything that's been said that's high quality uh, anywhere here, one idea might be to, uh, that we sometimes need to reconsider or pause before we want to start a new program. Because we have a bias, I think, in Minnesota for programs and systems and collaboratives and, and adding. And perhaps some of the benefit of the executive functioning literature, as far as I know it, which isn't very far, mindfulness, reflection, uh, take a time, turn, turn, the, turn the TV off. Um, you know, there's research that in some of our families it's on for 10, 12 hours a day. Um, take a walk, get some fresh air, try and lose some weight. Some simple strategies that perhaps those messages can be reinforced. I know at DHS the commissioner has taken on Climb the Stairs campaign, and you can see it actually changing people's profile over the last couple of years. Um, so there, there was a book, I'll just say this and then shut up, but a book by E.F. Schumacher called Small is Beautiful and Keep It Simple. And I just think sometimes we miss the forest for the trees because we don't look at sort of what's right in front of us, obvious, simple, big payoff kinds of things. Any other thoughts on what are the hurdles and how you might get over those or where are sort of the pressure points? I mean, a big hurdle is lack of funding, a lot of lack, lack of um, support for programs that are designed to help low-income families, and, and maybe not such an issue in Minnesota, but you know, in other states, um, there just isn't a lot of support for um, programs that help low-income families. And I think, you know, there certainly have been budget cuts that have affected um, funding for for new programs and new initiatives, and you experience that. Although I think things are improving now. Any other thoughts on what are hurdles? Well, we do have silos. I mean, I hate to say it, but we do. Um, and I think that that makes it really difficult, though, because they each have their own funding streams. And anyone who's tried to braid them knows how difficult that is. Um, and there are things that you can bill for, and then there's things that are grant funded. And trying to put that all together, it's like you almost need an economics degree. Um, to figure it out, and, and it shouldn't be that difficult. And I, and I think we also have systems that aren't really, you know, we have providers that work with adults and providers who work with children, and not as many that do it all together. And so we just need to start kind of mushing things together a little bit better than we do now. And yeah, go ahead. Well, Claudia, I don't disagree with you, but I, I do want to point out that for many nonprofits over the last couple of years through the recession, um, you know, with funding down and things like that, um, it actually takes time to actually recruit and train and monitor volunteers. And um, I think looking at any of the nonprofit directors out there, finding someone to fund a volunteer coordinator is really not an easy thing to do. And my national office is terrible about that. They start a new program and they say, just find a volunteer. And I just want to scream because it's <laughs> not that easy. Um, and so it just, I just want to add that caveat there because um, a volunteer coordinator is actually an administrative expense, not necessarily a program expense. And then everyone wants to keep your you know, administrative uh, costs below 20%. So just yes, but we got to figure out how to do that. And I'm going to push back because <laughs> I think that's a wonderful approach. And I bet the very same person, like Claudia, who could go knock at somebody's door could also be um, willing to maybe do a job share and be half a, a you know, a 
volunteer coordinator, and maybe some of you are shaking your head saying it's not that simple, but I do think there's this generation retiring that does want to make a difference. My dad's 83 and goes to read to low-income students at the, pre or the elementary school. And I, there's so many people who want to be of service and want to make a difference. And so what if there was this large-scale adopt-a-family effort where you know, you're retired, you might be willing to take on a family and ensure their success. So I think that's a great idea. And even if it's just a piece of it, you know, somebody just provides daycare while somebody's going to their GED. They can't do it now because they don't have child care. I guess there's liability issues and there's all those other things that go with it. It's complicated. So those are the barriers that we need to remove. Go ahead. any other since everybody sort of seemed to really sort of resonate with that comment I think we should just end there we're sort of <laughs> right at the end and I would just sort of hope that one of the things that people take away I do lots of meetings and lots of conferences and one of the things I'm always concerned about is that people enjoy listening they sort of think new things and then everybody goes back to their world and things stay the same and of really sort of thinking, where are the even small things you can do that really take this and do something with it to really start either conversations or, again, doing services differently to really try and take what we're learning and make a difference. So I would like to just sort of thank everybody. Thanks for inviting me to come. And I look forward to just sort of future conversations of where this all goes.